Well, I just have to say we got rung into the kingdom. That was just beautiful. And we're going to get um, read into the kingdom now. Open your Bibles, please, to uh, the gospel reading uh, from Mark 4, 35 to 41, and in your pew Bible on page 926. Are you ready to read? That day when evening came, Jesus, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen. Thank you, Lynn. Hopefully you can connect the two texts that we've read so far, Psalm and this reading in Mark. I'm preaching a series, uh, as you may have heard last week if you were here, from this book right here, Conversion in the New Testament, Paul and the Twelve by Richard Peace. Now, Richard does an interesting way, has an interesting way of identifying uh, sections of Scripture that speak to a particular movement in the disciples' lives. So he identified the first one that we touched on last week as Jesus the great teacher. The apostles, or disciples rather, are being called, and they don't yet know who Jesus is. They haven't yet been won over to a perspective on who he really is. They only see him as teacher. And so this week, as we read new scripture, I think you're going to see a movement in the disciples from, wow, we, we've been called to follow a great teacher to, oh no, he's something more than a teacher. He can do more than a teacher can do. He's better than a rabbi. He must be a prophet. And so that's where we're going to stand today. But if you have, still have your finger in page 926 in your uh, Pew Bible, Gospel reading, Mark 4, hold that finger there and turn back to our call to worship, Psalm 65. It's just fascinating to me and so much fun for me when I read the Bible and explore the Bible to see the way in which Sometimes the Bible quotes the Bible, or ideas that are present in the Old Testament are taken by New Testament writers and incorporated as they think about how to frame a story. And so you have the psalmist saying, you answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. God, our Savior, the one who saves us, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. Jesus is on the Sea of Galilee, passing from one side to the other. A storm has come up in Mark, and Psalm is talking about the same thing. You answer us with awesome deeds. The disciples say, don't you care that we drown? And Jesus answers with awesome and righteous deeds. Jesus acts as God the Savior in that moment even on the farthest seas. Who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength. Now listen again, verse 7. Who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of nations. 
Uh, sometimes seas prophetically refers to people. Sometimes seas and the turmoil, the roaring of the seas can exactly mean that, the turmoil of nations. Jesus comes for both, doesn't he? He's going to be one who stirs up the nations, actually, but he's also going to bring the gospel of peace. Jesus is going to be one who stills the roaring of the seas, literally in this story. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. So poetically rendered, so beautifully said and shared, and now we go to our gospel reading and the story or the praise that's embedded in the Psalms is brought forth in the story of Mark 4, Jesus in the boat. Verse 39, Mark 4, he got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And it became completely calm. Now, that miracle is not the focus of my uh, work this morning. What I hope for us to get out of this is the question that Jesus asks. What I hope for us to take away is that to ponder. For Jesus says to his disciples, in the midst of all of this turmoil, all of this difficulty, this one who the psalm, psalmist said formed mountains by his power and armed himself with strength, the one who the psalmist said stills the roaring of the seas. Now this is not teacher power. This is not pastor power. This is not normal power. This is genie of the lamp power. Oh, sorry for that illustration. This is extraordinary power. This is divine power. This is power that word the same generative word that brought forth everything in creation now speaks and changes the reality of the physical around it. Jesus speaks and the waves and the wind calm. Now what he speaks next is not be quiet, but I want you to listen because it is. When Jesus says, peace be still, he is not just speaking to the wind and the waves. Who do you think he's speaking to? The disciples. Because he asks them, he can see in their faces, he can see by what they've been going through, he can see by their question to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And listen to what they call him, teacher, right? Don't you care if we drown? He got up and rebuked the waves and he said to them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? That's a hard question. <clears throat> Spiritually, I've journeyed many years, pastored churches, and spiritually sometimes I'm still afraid. And Jesus' question to me this morning as a follower of him is, why are you still afraid? Do you still have no faith? I imagine some of you are in the same boat. Living life, finding yourself out in the storms of life on the sea and without trust that God will calm the seas and still the winds. And moreover, you're looking for him to do that externally when in reality, when he says, peace be still, yes, he's speaking to the wind and the waves, the text says so. He is also speaking to you. Trust me in the middle of the storm, Jesus is saying. When the waves are rocking the boat and the wind is tossing you about, when you've experienced the panic of wondering if you're going to make it, trust me in the midst of the storm. 
Can we do it? It's quoted in scripture, isn't it? One saying, yet though he slay me, will I trust him? When we're in the middle of the storm, where are we? Are we rebuking God? Teacher, do you not care if we drown? Are we panicked? Are we faithless? The disciples didn't yet know who he was, and sometimes I wonder if we yet don't know who he is. But I want to know who he is. I want to trust in the midst of the storm. I want to hear the words, peace be still, and in my heart be assured that God is with me, and though he slay me, yet will I trust him. None of us get out alive after all. Things calm down. Jesus had asked his question, and he didn't wait for an answer. And they didn't answer him directly. You can see them wide-eyed and white-faced. You can see them pale and shaking. You can see them with awe and amazement written all over their face. Because it's beginning to dawn on them who it is that is sitting in the boat with them. It's beginning to sink in. This is not Jesus, the great teacher. This is prophet power. This is Elijah and Moses power. Who is this? Who is this we're sitting with that even the wind and the waves obey him? That when he says, be calm, all is calm. In this section of scripture, Mark's appeal to us as followers of Jesus is to hear his voice when he says, peace, be still, and trust that not only will he control the wind and the waves that surround us, not only can he calm those, not only is he concerned for our well-being and that we not drown in the moment, but he's concerned that in the midst of the storm, we trust and believe and have faith. Remember last week, one of our thesis statements was that we might hear and believe. This week, Jesus is saying, don't you trust? Do you still not have any faith? Saying it to me, I think he's saying it to you. Do you still not have faith? Our response, like the disciples, if we're to move to the place that the gospel wants us to go, must be just as candid. We must pause in holy terror we must pause in great awe. We must pause with all of the respect that such an event would garner and all of the attention that such an event would force. And we must, like the disciples, in awe say, who is this that we're dealing with? That even the waves and the wind, they obey him. Our second gospel reading is from Mark 5, verses 21 to 24, and 35 to 36. Your pew Bible is page 927. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, 
a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. They said, why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. In those chapters that we looked at last week, we found Jesus likewise healing. Turn with me just to the beginning of the book of Mark. In the very beginning, chapter 1, in verse 21 to 28, we find Jesus driving out an evil spirit. 29 through 34 records that he healed many. 140 through 44 records the healing of a man with leprosy, a disease not only no one wanted to touch, but no one knew how to cure. In chapter 2, he goes beyond mere healing and forgives somebody their sins and in the course of forgiving them, connects forever for us bodily healing with spiritual healing. It's part of what the medical mission of the Adventist Church is about. We proclaim to patients not only good news about physical techniques for healing, but we lead them to a Christ who heals them by forgiving them as well. We find that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath at the end of two and as such takes the liberty of healing on the Sabbath in chapter 3. Notice in 3 verse 6 it says, The Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now this is all prior to what we're reading for today. At the end of four, uh, 3, excuse me, Jesus is being accused of being possessed of the same evil spirits that he drives out. How is it, Jesus says, that a man possessed of an evil spirit can then drive out another spirit? And he makes his argument. When we get to Mark 4 and Jesus calms the storm, we come to something really shifting. Not just teacher, not just Lord of Sabbath, but prophet. Something extraordinary is happening. And the same group of people who have wanted him dead, leaders, the Sanhedrin, I think this is in Jerusalem actually, have witnessed his miracles. Now the response where he is around Lake Galilee is different. And this leader of the synagogue, maybe Jairus was a leader of the synagogue uh, in his town, maybe Capernaum. But wherever Jairus is, he's not connected apparently with the Sanhedrin. At least he's not afraid to go beyond their determination to kill Jesus and find help for his daughter. In any event, we find Jairus appealing to Jesus, falling at his feet and saying, my daughter is dying, please come. Put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. Touch my daughter. Breathe your life, your healing into her. It's amazing what parents will do for children. Anything, really. We love them so much. We go to any lengths. Jairus would have appealed to anybody, popular, unpopular, if he really believed that his daughter could be healed. And here, I think, is the key. 
Here is a leader of the synagogue who believes that Jesus can heal his daughter. What has Mark, the writer of the gospel, been asking us to do all along? I'm listening. Believe. You got it. Mark has been asking us to believe in his gospel. And here Jairus, one of the leaders of the synagogue, believes that Jesus can help him and has come to Jesus to help his daughter. Now, what is really interesting about this story is, is a device Mark uses that I don't find in the other gospels. Mark starts to tell a story, and then he interjects another story, and then he comes back to the story he left. That's a storytelling technique that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So while he's crossed over and while all of this is happening with Jairus' daughter, and that would create a stir, wouldn't it? If somebody came in and said, please, come, lay your hands on my daughter, pray for her, she's dying, I need you. And the crowd is gathered around Jesus, don't you think that would create a bit of a stir? This isn't just anybody, this is one of the leaders of the synagogue. He is known in this town. He's respected in this town. He is one of the righteous of this town. Make no mistake. And amidst this buzz, Jesus starts looking around him distractedly. Who touched me is his question. We get the inside story from the gospel itself. A large crowd is pressed around Jesus, verse 25, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, but instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering can you imagine such a thing? All at once, Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? And the disciples were dismayed. What do you mean, who touched you? There's a whole crowd around you. But Jesus kept looking to see who had done it. The woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. And this was Jesus' response, daughter of Israel, daughter, your faith has healed you. Shalom, peace be unto you. Be still, peace be unto you, and be freed from your suffering. You've heard that phrase in connection with the story of the lake, peace be still. Peace be with you is shalom. Jesus says to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. All of this drama right in the middle of this story of drama with Jairus, or Jairus and his daughter. Jesus is not on point at this moment. He seems distracted. Something has happened. Nobody knows what. It seems ridiculous that he's obsessed that somebody would have touched him. And yet, so powerful was this woman's faith that it healed her. Now let's break this down just really quickly. Mark, our gospel writer, is after us to believe Jesus has spoken to the wind and the waves and said, peace be still, be calm, shalom. May all be at rest and peace. He's asked the disciples, do you still have no faith? And now this woman who is unclean has no right to be in this crowd and certainly no right to touch him, presumes to quietly sneak up behind him, thinking that it will not matter. It only matters to her if she can just somehow touch the hem of his garment. And she knows what happened. She touches that hem, and immediately peace comes to her in her body, and she feels that she is okay. Okay. 
She knows she has that sense that she is now healed. She is fine. And Jesus, being the spiritually sensitive and alive and fully alive person that he was, knows that something has gone from him. But I don't think our gospel writer or Jesus is focused on necessarily working to uh, identify and punish the offender. We see in the story instead Jesus is focused on an awareness, and that awareness shifts from uncleanness and unworthiness to a declaration of belonging. My daughter, daughter of Israel, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has healed you. You, blessed are you, because you have believed. You've believed. Go in peace. Peace be with you. Don't you want to hear those words of Jesus in your life? Well, they're yours. The gospel, not me, not by my power or authority, but the gospel speaks them to you right now. Believe. Believe. You can imagine what people thought. He's freed her from her suffering. And in freeing one, he's been distracted and he hasn't gone to the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and representatives have come from that house saying, your daughter is dead, why bother? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, here it is again, don't be afraid. What does Jesus say on the lake? Why are you still so afraid? Don't be afraid, he says. Just believe. In this particular case, Jesus decides not to let anyone follow him except Peter, James, John, the brother of James, and they go to the home of the synagogue leader, and Jesus sees a commotion there with people crying and wailing loudly. Already the mourners are gathering. He went into them and said, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. That's rough. I like the sentence that's next. It gives you a lot of space to imagine what happens in the meantime. <laughs> After he put them all out, it says, but they laughed at him. And then the next sentence is, after he put them all out, <laughs> Jesus cleansing the temple of the money changers. You can just see him in this home. Ouch. Go. He's already limited who's going to be with him of the apostles. And now these doubters are here, these laughers, these people who have no faith. They've just showed up to mourn. And for some of them, they don't even know the girl. Well, they're going to do this professionally and they're going to get paid and there's going to be food. And it, she's out. Go. I don't see him as particularly polite or long-winded in this situation. I see him as getting this done. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha ka'um, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12. At this time, they were completely astonished, the scripture says. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Now, what is one of the first things that Jesus does with his disciples after his own resurrection? He eats with them. He eats with them on the road to Emmaus. He eats fish with them on the Sea of Galilee at the campfire where they're gathered there. He eats with them. And the first thing he tells the parents to do when this lovely girl comes back to life is says, give her something to eat. It's as if he's 
going a step beyond just the appearance of resurrection and saying, how is it that a ghost could eat food, right? This is not an aberration before your eyes. This is flesh and blood. Feed her. Take care of her. I love this story. There's an Old Testament story of a child raised by a prophet, son of a widow, and Elijah goes into this boy and lays upon him, actually, and prays for him and raises him from the dead. The Gospel of Mark, as written by the disciple Mark, Mark is not blind to this. As he tells this story and the astonishment of the parents and the witnesses, he's reminding us of something. Jesus is not just a teacher. Jesus is not just another good man. Jesus is not just a sophist or a traveling wise man. Jesus is not just a trickster or a magician. Jesus is not, pick a social category. He's none of these things. Jesus is something far more extraordinary. He's one who not only controls the wind and the waves, but speaks peace into people's lives. And while he's at it, he doesn't just heal the sick. And he doesn't just forgive the sinners. And he doesn't just love and include the daughters of Israel, even the unclean daughters of Israel. He raises the dead. Extraordinary. And what John wants us to hear, what John wants us to hear in this story, I, I keep saying John, I did that last week too. Right at the end, same, same timing, must be the same pattern. Mark says, don't be afraid, just believe, verse 36. And then he says this. Don't tell anyone. Give her something to eat. Third Gospel reading comes from Mark 6, verses 6 through 13, and verse 30. On your pew Bibles is on pages 927 and 928. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. Then went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that had done and taught. Rabbis teach. They have pupils, they have followers. And prophets have the school of prophets or often have protégés. Jesus is telling them to have faith, to have faith, to have faith. Verse 6 of 6 comes back to this and tells us the problem. Jesus, he, was amazed, just as they're amazed at what he can do, 
They're amazed that he can raise the dead, heal the sick, calm the sea. They're amazed, 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 amazed. Jesus is amazed at their lack of faith. I am saddened when I think that I know my God is amazed at times at my lack of faith. What a recrimination. Jesus went around teaching from village to village, as was just read. Calling his disciples, he sent them two by two to do as he did. Only he added a stipulation and a challenge. He said, I want you to do it from the same place of apparent powerlessness that I do. In other words, I don't want you to rely on position. I don't want you to rely on power. I don't want you to rely on money. I don't want you to rely on situation. I don't want you to rely on things. What am I supposed to do? For we are living in a material world. And I am a material boy. (laughs) What are we to do? Take just one staff, sandals, no change of clothes, no extra silver or gold. Just go. And if you're received, bless them. And if you're not, shake the dust off your feet as a curse to them, a testimony against them. Go, heal the sick, drive out demons in my name. Believe. Let's put belief into practical action. And you know, they were inspired enough, knew enough. They were something because they went out and they actually tried what Jesus told them to do. And guess what happened? Jesus gave them through their faith the power to do what he had done. Now, we don't have record that the disciples are running out and raising the dead. They are, after all, protégés at this point. But we do have record that they came back and reported to Jesus all that they had done. And let's just hear the report one more time. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and all that they had taught. And in verse 13, we see what that amounted to. 12.2, they had preached and told people that they should repent. Remember, forgiveness and healing go together. Jesus illustrated that already for us in Mark. Jesus said, I forgive you. You are forgiven. Your sons, your sins, excuse me, are forgiven you. Go in peace, my son. And the man did, and he was healed. They preached that people should repent, and they drove out demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. They came and laid their hands on the sick and prayed for them and the power of God was with them. Mark is showing us something here at the end. Jesus is amazed at their lack of faith at the beginning of this chapter, but then he decides to test the faith, and he sends them forth with nothing extra in the world but to do his bidding and to do what he asked them to do, and they do it. And the results are amazing. From a place of no power, from a place of no wealth, from a place of no position, from a place of no material strength, by faith, they move into a community, they touch, they heal, they anoint, they pray, they cast out, and they encourage people to pursue spiritual healing, to let go of that which entraps them, and to seek forgiveness for their sins. I wonder if when they came back and reported all this, Jesus was still so amazed at their lack of faith. He may have still been. But we see a huge transformation in just a very short period of time.
And the transformation occurs not only in the disciples themselves as they learn to do what Jesus did, but the transformation comes in them because they have moved in their perspective. They have shifted their perspective. They're not just dealing with somebody who says interesting things, who has a new idea about how religion ought to be. They're dealing with somebody who, when he speaks, the wind, the waves, the spirits, the bodies, they don't ignore him. They obey him. He is a great prophet. Stay tuned. Next week, Mark will tell us that he's not just a great prophet, but that he is the Messiah. Thank you for being with us. The deacons are going to collect our offering at this time, which is for our upcoming general conference session. Please don't forget your ties, and please don't forget your church budget support as well, as we, together, by faith, support the ministry of this church.